All right, listen, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish is really, really good. I like this film quite a lot, and I just want to get that out of the way right at the beginning so there's no confusion. I haven't rewatched the Shrek films in a while, so don't quote me on this, but I'm leaning towards saying it's probably the best movie in the whole franchise. It has amazing visuals, fluid animation, solid themes, and of course, the glue that ties all that together, brilliant writing and execution for said themes. This is a story about a man who spent his whole life as this big legend who fears nothing, lives large, and has never been touched by a blade, as the songs say. He's renowned worldwide and beloved by most, and on the surface, he seems absolutely content with this life. It's not until his brief but terrifying brush with death himself that he realizes his own mortality, and sees how he's wasted all the lives he's been given up to that point, which ultimately leads him down a path where he learns what it means to truly live. It's not just about being famous or infamous or legendary. None of that really amounts to anything when you don't have anyone to share it with. Life is about forging relationships and sharing yourself with the people that you love, and Puss learns all this by the end of the movie. This video is going to be chock full of Puss in Boots 2 spoilers, so if it's one of those movies that you skipped for one reason or the other, I'm sending you away before I say anything that gives away more than I already have. I tried to keep that synopsis as vague as possible because this is definitely a movie that's worth checking out. You don't even have to have seen the first one to get what's happening, either. If anything, watching that one will just make you more confused. Like I said, I have I haven't watched any of the other Shrek movies in some time, but I do not remember Puss in Boots 1 very fondly. Which is all the more reason why I was so shocked to see how good this movie is, and I want you guys to all experience that for yourselves. So scram, shoo, get out of here, you little rascals. Leave with the knowledge that it gets the old Sheev Talk stamp of approval. It's like a 9 out of 10. But all that being said, I do have a few issues with this film. And most of them are pretty small, like, I think Goldilocks's art could have been set up just a little better. It's mostly fun. Fine, and I really, really like the resolution, even if the dialogue is pretty overt. You was gonna make the wish, but you didn't make the wish because you wanted to save your family. And I, I was really scared. I know! You know. I know. I got it. I got the concept. But I also think this movie could have done a better job showing that she's not happy with her current family situation if it's going to tell us that her secret wish was to have a regular human family. For most of the film, she seems to get along with them just fine and even seems to really love being with them. And maybe that was the point. Like, the idea that she had what she wanted all along and she just couldn't see it, which ended up being the lesson she learned by the end. But as it stands, I don't see that we've been given any reason to believe she's unhappy where she is to the point where she would go on a whole course quest to find a wishing star that would alter her reality. The only time the film ever sets up anything hinting toward this motivation is when she's arguing with Baby Bear and he tells her that she's not even a real bear. You're not even a bear! Zing! <laughs> Which you could take to mean that even her own adopted brother doesn't really consider her as one of them, but you otherwise never get that impression from him anywhere else in the story, so I don't know if that's even what they were going for there. But that's all beside the point anyway, because like I said, I think the arc Goldie goes on in this film is pretty neat, and I won't lie to you all and pretend I didn't shed a small tear in that final just right scene. Damn you DreamWorks, you done it again. The actual reason I've called you all here today is that there's one fairly small aspect of this movie that, upon a second viewing, kind of bothered me a bit more than I'd expected it to. Having seen the film already, I had all the pieces of the puzzle and was just waiting for them all to fall into place, and this one tiny aspect was bugging me a lot with the benefit of hindsight. Especially with the added time that I've had to really think about about this issue and consider how easily it could have been fixed to make the film as a whole that much better. The problem I'm talking about is the fact that the Shrek characters all exist and have met Puss in Boots at this point in his life. Where the first movie was a prequel set before he met them, we know that this film is set after the fact thanks to the scene where he first encounters the wolf, and his lives flash before his eyes showing him with Shrek and Donkey crossing a bridge. And the scene at the end when he says he needs to visit some old friends and we pan across the sea to find ourselves sailing toward the land of far far, far away. No doubt setting up the long-awaited Shrek 5, which... Fuck it, I'm hyped for. Let's see what they do with that. And last I checked, Puss was on pretty good terms with all the characters of Shrek, so tell me why, when the village doctor asks him if there's anywhere he can go in his time of need, does he not even mention them? He plays it off like he has plenty of options, and that the problem, if anything, is that he can't decide between them all, but it's pretty overt in its messaging that he has no one to go to, and that's even one of the main themes of his arc in this film. He spent so long pushing everyone away that he ended up sad and alone. So it's pretty safe to say that 
team Shrek isn't an option, which is something that raises a lot of questions for me, but the film doesn't even seem to realize what they've just established, and in fact they act like it's all fine by the end. But it was pretty clear to the doctor that he had no one, which was the entire reason that he recommended Mama Luna, a lady who takes care of stray cats, and that's where Puss ends up going after his first encounter with the wolf. Not to Shrek, but to some random stranger. But if you really stop to think about it, a lot of the story would have played out much differently had Puss gone to Shrek instead of to Mama Luna. And since the end of the film establishes that they're still on good terms, I really don't understand why he wouldn't have. He never would have even heard of Mama Luna had he simply mentioned that he had people who could take him in, so after he meets the wolf, he would have immediately gone to them in his time of need. And if he never goes to Mama Luna, then he never ends up meeting Perito, and probably he's never found by Goldilocks and the Three Bears, since they were relying on tracking his scent, and that would no longer have been an option if he'd managed to get to sea before they could reach him. And if they never find him, he never finds out that the Wishing Star is real or where to steal the map, so he never would have gone on the quest to get his lives back. He most likely would have spent the rest of his life crashing with Shrek, wallowing in self-pity until the wolf caught up to him. And even if the Bear family did find him, the film still plays out much differently, because he'd either be going at it alone without Perito and possibly without Kitty, or he would have been backed by the Shreks. Now right now, some of you are probably asking where I'm going with all this, because really this is such a minor nitpick that it's practically inconsequential. And yes, you're right, I really don't think this is that big a problem with this otherwise stellar movie, but it is still a problem that I think could have easily been fixed in a way that would have actually enhanced the themes they were going for, so I can't help but feel a little frustrated that they missed the opportunity. The only thing you'd have to do to fix this is have the Doctor ask about the Shreks. I mean, they're pretty famous, right? So if he asks Puss if they'll take him in and he says something along the lines of, oh, we're not really on speaking terms at the moment, and then maybe when his lives are flashing before his eyes, we see him having a heated argument with them or something. That ties right into the narrative that Puss has pushed away everyone in his life that ever cared for him. Then at the end of the film, when they're sailing off into the sunset, instead of saying, I'm gonna go see some old friends, he could say something like, I have to go make some amends. Right there with that very simple fix, we're adding to the themes of the story while also accounting for other characters who, by all right, should have played some kind of role in this movie given the context that we had. And you might say, oh, will you just want to see Shrek and Donkey and have forced fan service, but first of all, what is forced fan service if not having flashbacks showing Shrek and Donkey and having Puss sail toward a familiar and iconic location at the end of the film? If anything, I'm saying it would need to be all or nothing if they're not going to account for their absence in some other way. Either set this movie before the mainline Shrek films or have them play some sort of role in this story so the audience isn't left wondering. I remember one of the most consistent criticisms early MCU films were getting in like phase two was, why aren't X heroes showing up in Y films? Why isn't Tony calling any of the Avengers in to help stop the Mandarin in Iron Man 3? Why isn't Cap calling Tony when S.H.I.E.L.D. is being overtaken by Hydra and the Winter Soldier? It's not necessarily that we just want to see our favorite heroes in the standalone films for the sake of fan service. It's just that we know these characters exist and they would have no reason not to help with these big world-ending threats other than because the movie simply isn't about them. So the solution is either to put them in the movie movie anyway, like Civil War did, or account for their absence in some other way, like setting the film in a location where none of the Avengers could really do anything to help in the current conflict, like Ragnarok. You can't simply tell me that Iron Man wouldn't help stop this evil Nazi splinter group that spent the last 70 years infiltrating the highest positions of the government, because that is absolutely something that Tony would want to help out with. It's either out of character for him to decide not to do anything about it, or it's out of character for Steve, Nat, and Fury for not telling him what's going on. On. Either way, these are factors that need to be accounted for when you're trying to build a cinematic universe. And I'm not necessarily suggesting that DreamWorks is building some big Shrek cinematic universe, but then again, they kind of already have and seem to be intent on continuing it. Besides, what else am I supposed to make of that god-awful new intro they're putting at the beginning of all their new movies that couldn't be any more of a Marvel copycat if it tried? I'm not against any new Shrek movies as long as they're good, but in the future I'd like for the little things like this to be taken into consideration. That's all. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you didn't, then well, I just wasted a whole lot of my time, haven't I? Before I sign off, I wanted to let you guys know that I've been working on a pretty big video since the beginning of this year, and I really want to focus most of my time on just getting it done, so there might be a bit of a dry spell where you guys don't hear from me. Just figured it was worth mentioning in case you all decided I gave up on you and turned into ravenous, cannibalistic murder machines. I'll soon be back, and in greater numbers, but for now, stay fresh. Or... Er
whatever the hell you kids say these days. Oh, also join my Discord, you fuckers.